Hello everyone, this is John Buck. I'm back for another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, and this video is the second application of the Discrete Fourier Transform, that is using it for filtering. Uh, if you haven't already seen the videos on uh, the concepts and the equations, and also the first e example of just sampling and frequency, I recommend that you pause this and go back and watch those, because it's meant to come after you've, you've watched those earlier videos. Uh, but that the idea of filtering here is, is we've seen in different versions of the Fourier transform this very powerful idea and useful idea that we can implement a filter by taking two things from the time domain, computing their Fourier transforms, multiplying them in frequency, and then going back to the time domain. So that's been a very useful theoretical tool up until now. We're going to see today how this gets implemented as a computational tool for solving real filtering problems or gets used all the time this way with the DFT. And we'll see that, as always, the, the trick with the DFT is to watch out for the time domain aliasing. The most important thing we need to do is make sure that when we compute our DFTs, not just that we have enough samples and frequency to avoid aliasing the input, but even that we have enough samples, even more samples and frequency, so that we don't alias the eventual output. So we have to avoid aliasing on both the input and the output side. And when we do that correctly, we can use this, it turns out, to be a very computationally efficient way to find convolutions uh, in the frequency domain using the DFT. So let me pause the video, switch over to the whiteboard, and explain where that comes from. And then the second half of this video, I will show you a MATLAB example, how that actually works. OK. Again, our topic for today is circular convolution, which is the kind of convolution we get when we multiply two DFTs. And so if we want to think about the DFT in convolution, right, let's, let's assume we have, uh, we'll let x of n and h of n be finite length signals. Okay, so we'll assume, maybe we'll, I'll draw a little uh, silhouette cartoons here. So uh, in this case, we'll assume x like we, we had earlier. And we want to convolve these because h is, is some filter we're interested in. So x will be m points long, m is in Michael, and, or, or moose, perhaps. Um, and, and h, that we want to convolve it with the filter, We'll say it goes from 0 uh, to p minus 1. p is in porcupine. All right, so we want to compute this convolution, but we'll see how do we do this with the DFT to avoid any uh, artifacts from aliasing. Well, we know uh, in general so far we said that the convolution we want, back the good old convolution from uh, chapter 2, if we're convolving these two things in time, this is the same as multiplying them in frequency. Right, so it corresponds to saying y of e to the j omega would just be what we get if we multiply them one omega at a time, each omega one after the other. And so it says, well, if I now computed the DFT of this thing, it would be like sampling them all in omega. So let me um, bring this over a little bit to make myself some, some more room so I'm not so crowded. I guess I could also do it like this now that I think of it. So imagine I say I take this equation, I'm going to evaluate both sides with that sampling and frequency for the same big N. So I'm going to take y of e to the j omega and evaluate it every 2 pi over nk. And if these are true at every omega, this still has to be true at this subset of omegas that I'm evaluating at, right? So this is still oh, this fire there. Right, I'm just evaluating it at n discrete values of, of little omega. If this is true for every little omega in continuous, it still has to be true for the discrete ones. And then I can bring, saying, well, if I take the product and then I sample, it's the same thing as if I took the samples and then I found the product afterwards. So I can bring this evaluating 
inside the brackets here. But if I start looking at these now, we say, well, from the, the uh, discussions we've had in the earlier videos for today's class, this is just sampling and frequency is saying the DFT of the output. And each of these would be X of K. That's the DFT of the input and the DFT of the filter. So I'm just going through and multiplying them for each K from 0 up to n minus 1, where n is the number, n, capital N, is the uh, number of samples in, I took in omega, in frequency. Right, so it's saying that I, I have this equation here when I'm done. I'm saying I multiply the two uh, DFTs of the input, and, and I guess it's important to mention that all these, for this to work, I need all three of these to have the same DFT size N, right? It only makes sense to be multiplying these things in frequency if these are the same omegas that were sampled at. So I need these all to have the same DFT size. And then we say, well, is there going to be aliasing or not? Well, this, this is what makes it clear. I need to not only avoid aliasing both of these things on the input when I sampled omega, but I also need to have avoided sampling this on the output. right? So we saw in uh, convolution oh, that we, we end up Summing, okay, again. summing the length, right? That if I have this convolution here, that the length of the output could be as much as it'll start at zero and it will end at the sum of the endpoints. So that would be m plus p minus two. So in cartoon form, I may not know what y of n is, but when I convolve two finite signals, I know when it is, even if I don't know what it is, that it will start at zero and then I add the endpoints, m plus p minus 2. And so the length of this, to find the length, I take the end minus the start and add 1. So this is m plus p minus 1 samples long. So I need to make sure my, my DFT size is big enough to avoid aliasing this output as well as the inputs if I'm going to do this uh, correctly so that when I do go back to the time domain, and we'll call this y sub n, is what we get with the inverse DFT of y of k. Right, we have the, the takeaway message here is that the DFT-derived version, that y sub n of n will equals the original linear convolution of n if n is greater than m plus p minus 1. So that, that the length of the, the number of frequency samples is not only longer than both of the inputs, but it's longer than the sum of their lengths minus 1 um, for the convolution of the output. So this is, again, to avoid aliasing in time for the output. And this operation is also sometimes this, this idea of, of that when I when I compute this, if I look at this carefully, say, well, this is exactly what I would get if I multiply these two when I'm at, at this stage here, right? I've got, I've multiplied these two in frequency, I've convolved in time. And then when I do this sampling, right, coming down to here, this is like I alias y of n in time every n samples. Right? This is the same thing we saw earlier in the, in the earlier videos, that sampling and frequency is taking the equivalent time signal and aliasing it with the spacing that's due to the, the the spacing is equal to the number of samples, this n, the number of samples in frequency. So, oh, it's terrible. Let me write it again so you can actually read it. So that I can think of this sequence of operations in frequency. Let me write this down because it's important too. So the circular convolution.
is what happens in time when I multiply x of k times h of k. Uh, there are different notations people use for this, but one common one you might see is instead of the star, you write a circle with a number in it where this is the, the size, because the, the answer will be different for the different cases. Right, so in this case, it's saying this is an endpoint circular convolution, where I'll put the n in, in the middle of the, the circle here. Uh, but another good way to think about this is if I need to compute the circular convolution, if I want to just purely in the time domain predict what's going to happen, the answer is what I get if I compute the linear convolution. So I use my usual ticker tape or some other method for convolving finite signals, my favorite graphical method. So I do that followed by aliasing in time every n samples. So let's see an example of how that works. But in the big picture, so multiplying, it's worth reiterating before I go on, multiplying the two DFTs gives a rise to an a, a operation in time we call circular convolution which is basically the same as our standard linear convolution followed by aliasing. If we make the, the number of samples and frequency big enough, circular convolution will equal linear convolution because if it's enough samples and frequency, there won't be any aliasing of y of n either, and I'll avoid any uh, corruption of my data that way. So I can use this approach with DFTs to get the standard convolution and filtering I want as long as I'm careful to have a big enough DFT size. So let's look at an example. Imagine I have this rectangular pulse that's, in this case, this is uh, n equals 8 samples long, right? It goes from 0 to 7. And I'm going to filter it with this filter that averages the current signal with the two previous ones, right? I have three samples that are all height 1 third. So, oh, I had the wrong thing here. This wasn't, to keep my notation consistent, this should be m. So I have m equals 8, p equals 3, and I want to compare these two convolutions. So I'm going to do the normal convolution, and then I'm going to do the thing where I take the DFT of both pieces with the same number of samples and frequency, multiply those samples together to get the new output sample and frequency, and take the inverse DFT. So I want you to do first to get ready and just to get a little practice as we head towards the final to review, pause the video here and do this convolution with ticker tape or however you like, your favorite approach to doing finite length convolutions. So take pause the video for a second and do this and, and, and make sure you can sort of practice those skills. And then we'll come back and compare answers before we go on and talk about this part. Okay, so now we're back. If we look at what happened, your y of n should look like this. That you should have had something that ramps up as one third at zero, then two thirds, and then it levels off and says it's one once it gets sort of the that the h is totally inside the x in our graphical flip and shift, we'll see that, that it, it keeps a nice steady value. And then once it goes beyond 7, the h starts sliding out the other side, going past x, and it, we have this transient where it ramps down again. So this is the goal. This is what I want to get. And we're going to look at, uh, in a minute in MATLAB, two cases. We'll see if n equals 8, that would not be enough. If, if I only took 8 samples, even though that's that's enough to avoid aliasing the input, right? Both of these are less than eight samples, so I won't alias either one of these when I sample in frequency like that. But I will see that this will be aliased, right? This output is 10 points long. And so one way I can think about that alias, I, as I saw earlier, I could make copies of this every eight and see them overlapping. The other trick is to keep zero to seven, and then remembering back to the first video I showed you with the can, is to wrap these two back to the front. So I take whatever's at n and put it here at 0, then n plus 1, and so on until I run out of values. And I add them in. So it's again like I'm wrapping the signal around a can that isn't quite big enough. And these last two values, the can has circumference n. So I take 0 to n minus 1 and wrap it around the can. And then these last two overlap again. This would be 2 thirds. And then I add them up. And when I add them up, what I'll see is, is, I'll call this y sub 8 of n, is 2 thirds plus 1 third would just be 1. 2 thirds, or 1 third plus 2 thirds is 1, 
two thirds plus one third is one. But then everywhere else it was zero. So if I do this with eight samples in frequency, I'm going to distort my output. Instead of getting this thing that ramps on, is nice and smooth, and then ramps down again, I'll just get a square, a flat pulse that's the wrong answer, right? It doesn't match what linear convolution would give me. So this is the result. Even though I did not alias the input, I can alias the outputs and get a bad signal. But then I'll also show you the case If I use n equals 10, but when I wrap it around, right, this 10, that holds the whole signal, right? 10 is more than the length of the output signal. So if I, if I do think about wrapping around, I wrap 10 around to 0. Well, this is n equals 10 on top of n equals 0, but this is already 0 for all these values. And so there's no distortion. And if I did that, I'd get exactly the same thing back again. So we go 1, 2 thirds, then up to 1. There's no aliasing. And that's a good thing. That makes us happy. Because it means we get back exactly the signal we wanted. Oh. Some glitch with my input pen there. So up until seven, it's nice and even, and then it ramps down again just the way we want it to. Right, so the key idea here is that y of 10 is equal to the original linear convolution if I have n equals 10. So that's what's going to happen if I do this all computationally, knowing what's going on theoretically. Let's see it. Let's actually do the computation. Let me get this out of the way. Bring my MATLAB window down where you can see it. All right, we're not, I'm not going to do all those multiplies myself by hand. But here's my example code. I'm going to define x to be uh, a rectangular pulse that's 8 long with time from 0 to 7. And then my filter, h, has height 1 third, right? And it goes from 0 to 2. First thing is just the standard linear convolution. So I use the conv command to get y, and I use this to get the times for y, so when I go to plot it, I've got the right time indices underneath it. Right? I add the first values of the time indices and the last values. Now let's do it with, look at what happens if I sample in frequency with two different sets of n. So the number of samples first is 8. So I, I'm going to compute my the FFT again is the, the command that does the DFT sum. Right? This is like the analysis equation implemented as a computer program. It is not like. It is the analysis equation implemented as a computer program. So I get 8, x8 and h8 by taking the Fourier transform of x and h. Multiply them together, k one term at a time. Right, That's the dot times is, is the h. Um, I'm sorry, each k gets multiplied. And then the IFFT is the synthesis equation. This is going backwards from frequency to time. It's the inverse. And so this is the synthesis equation getting me back to the time domain. And I'll have uh, the same number of samples as y8 here. I'll have eight samples, so I need to define a time axis. I go through the same process, but now with 10 samples. And I'm going to plot the three cases. I'll see the linear convolution in the top panel, the, uh, the circular convolution, using the frequency domain, the, using the DFT in the middle panel with n equals 8, and then with n equals 10. So let me get that window and bring it down here into the main view. And when I do that, we can see here's the linear convolution just like we expected. 1 third, 2 third, up to 1, nice and flat up until n equals 7, and then ramping down again. However, if, if I take those two DFTs, I didn't alias the inputs, but I still have this aliased output, right? This case does not match the top case, right? I, I plotted them to make sure the time axes are the same, but I only got eight values back because that's all the number of frequencies I sampled at, right? So I made the signal periodic essentially every eight, and I'm just showing the one period here. I, I, it says I've got the eight samples that come back into my time domain, and I've, I've taken these last two values here, have been wrapped around and added on top of these first two, to alias it. But when I go to n equals 10, oh, this is the wrong title. That's bad. I should have fixed that. Let me go fix the, uh, the window open so 
circular convolution with n equals 10. There, much better. So now I have the right label on it. We can see it's exactly equal to the linear convolution. So because I took a large enough set of samples and frequency, I not only avoided aliasing my inputs, but I also aliased the eventual output, which I can do because I know the longest it could be based on the finite sizes of the input. All right, so this has turned out to be quite a long video, uh, but I did want to cover this. This is the second main application we'll see for using the DFT, which is using it for filtering, because it turns out it's often, in many cases, it can be faster to do the two Fourier transforms, multiply in frequency, and come back to the time domain than to do all the convolution by hand for large, complicated filters. All right, so I'll stop here. Uh, that's all for this time, and I'll see you in the next video.